All right, and we're away. So uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us and welcome to this Tashkil talk. Uh, my name is Finn Murray Jones. I'm the membership and studio coordinator at Tashkil. The Tashkil lecture series features inspiring practitioners and professionals working at the forefront of international visual art and design. Uh, it seeks to highlight technical innovation, shine a spotlight on pioneering practices, and provide important insights. Uh, today, it is my absolute great pleasure to welcome Mohamed Ashibani, Momo, and Moza Al Matrushi, uh, two UAE based artists. Uh, Mohamed Al Shibani is a comic book artist and holds a BSc in graphic design from the American University of Sharjah uh, and an MFA in sequential art from the Savannah College of Art and Design. He works traditionally using any tool that provides an incline and creates stories inspired by the macho era of comics. Mohamed has exhibited with Fan Designs and the first Project Mega exhibition, and he has contributed to Amore, a magazine of random. Mohamed is a Tashkeem instructor and joined us as a member in 2012. Uh, Moza al Matrushi is a Sharjah based conceptual artist who obtained an MFA from Slade School of Fine Art in London. Al Matrushi's practice is currently positioned within the study of erased mythologies from the Arabian Peninsula, which she correlates with present modes of seeing. Within this lens, the exploration of these themes materializes in performances, uh, moving image and audio media, and text based work. Recent work has culminated in a performance in the Victorian Albert Museum in London uh, and a residency in Townhouse Gallery in Cairo, Egypt. Uh, the title of today's talk is Generative Art Practices. And uh, just so you will know, the talk is not scripted. It's an open conversation um, between myself, Mohammed, and Moza. And uh, please, at any point, uh, if anyone has any questions, uh, you can raise your hand and please do feel, feel free to chip in. Um, so we'll start off by uh, looking at the, the personal journeys of, of Moza and Momo and how they kind of came to be doing what they're doing now. Uh, and then we will start from there and uh, pick up in, in greater detail. Uh, before we begin, a couple of housekeeping rules. Um, uh, yes, as I mentioned, uh, if you have any questions at any point, raise your hand. Um, and please note the session is being recorded as you already know. So without further ado, Moza and Momo, welcome. Thank you so much again for joining us. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned, uh, let's kick off. Perhaps Momo, if you'd like to start um, just, you know, a brief introduction about yourself uh, and, you know, what you studied, where you studied, how you came to be doing what you're doing now. Um, yeah, please, far away. Well, first off, you said this is unscripted, so I have to get rid of the script I've prepared. Throw, practicing throw, throw just <laughs> throwing away all the scripts for everyone. I'm just like, I need to seem like a decent human being. This is recorded. <laughs> this is on Tashkil. I can't be myself. Um, as far as where I began. So um, everyone who knows me knows I'm completely obsessed with drawing. And to say the least, I'm obsessed with drawing. Well, I, when I started, I was very much in AUS and I was, I was maintaining a lot of sketchbooks. I was in graphic design. And I just wanted to make comics. I really wanted to make comics. In fact, I was the only person who checked out this book called Comics and Sequential Art out of the AUS library. I think I was the only one who checked it out years at a time, consistently <laughs> renewing, you know, consistently renewing the lease. Listen, if it's available and I can have it and I can read it and I can hug it at night, I will do that. And so um, after that, I decided to you know, invest in at least getting a job because it's as is expected, you you know, as is expected of the, the, the males of the species in my family, you go find a job, a real job. And so I did do that. I did work in the golf club in terms of a front of face uh, position where I met a lot of people, met a lot of contacts, but didn't stifle my yearning for comics. Like it's, it's an obsession. It's not even no longer like a thing I love. No, no, no. I obsess about this. And I decided to head out to Savannah, Georgia, of all places, to the Savannah College of Art and Design to get a master's of fine arts degree in sequential art. And that's why I do, I'm always encouraging people, if you can find a school where you can study what you love, you should do it. And it should be something that you are passionate about, not so much something that you're just choosing willy nilly. And I say this from my personal experience in terms of one, it gives you access to so much more information that you can't even get your hands on here. I had access to so many comic books, whether they were indie stuff by Robert Crumb, stuff that you're not even supposed to look at. So weird and strange uh, artist editions, everything available in the library, Amazon, 
two day delivery. It's not even two days. They mock me. It's a day. It's like you press a button and it just appears in your, you know, your doorstep the next day. And here I am like gobbling these comics up like tremendously. And so it's, it helps that the circumambient locations where comics are available, mm -hmm. they're easily accessible. And that's really important part of the grad school, but it also, it also made me become, uh, how do I say this, uh, a tyrannical tyrant, t double T's over there, the TT for craft. And I found a, an obsessive love for craft. How do I get this to look the best as possible? And it somehow informed um, my personal values and it morphed into my personal beliefs about what to do when it comes to craft, well, you do the best you can, you find purpose and purpose will drive you forward. And then after you, you're driven forward enough, hopefully not off a cliff, you generally see where your mistakes are and you're never going to be there. And the journey just is longer and longer. And I guess what I'm trying to say is this is the obsession. Like I can't stop talking about it. And it's just, I can go in tangents about the craft. And ever since then I had to come back to the UAE for my military service. I, um, taught drawing and I was giving workshops, some at Tashkil for making comics. And then after that, I finally managed to secure a job in a company called Sandstorm in Abu Dhabi. It wasn't brief, but nothing about me is brief, sir. <laughs> no, that was excellent. Thank you, Mama. Uh, Moza, please tell us a little bit about, about you. Yeah, so um, for me, it, it started with the um, Fine Arts College in Zaidi University. Uh, then jumped to uh, SIF. I was part of the second cohort uh, in the Sheikha Salama Emerging Artist Fellowship. Um, and uh, at that time was working between different uh, art and design um, offices or institutions, even some architecture offices as well, before I could determine what it is that I am really fascinated about. Um, um, I always thought it was the sculptural aspect of things and, and wanted to pursue a, a sculpture pathway in school, uh, for grad school. Um, until I came across the uh, fine art media pathway at the Slade School of Art, where basically, well, the Slade School of Art has three pathways, painting, sculpture, and fine art media. And fine art media is where um, all the people who don't want to <laughs> paint and, uh, and do sculpture just find themselves there, uh, but also painters who don't want to be engaging in the regular conversations that they might imagine they would be having with other painters. Um, and so they, they come to the fine art uh, uh, media program. And that's where I found myself. Um, and before landing there, I had already been uh, interested in entanglements that um, seesaw between land and food as, as things that can stand in for language. I mean, of all the symbols that I, could have been fascinated about it was it was those two in particular and so those were heavily explored uh, during grad school um, and a love for I guess uh, culinary explorations uh, led me to go into culinary school right after grad school so I trained as a pastry chef um, and um, and then moved back here after the residency in townhouse uh, in Cairo um, and uh, set up my studio practice in Sharjah, where I am still very much caught in between these entang entanglements of, of food and land, uh, specifically in agricultural practices at the moment. Um, I had hoped that uh, I'd be, you know, just this busy chef. Uh, leading a, a glamorous uh, kitchen life um, that did not work out for me, um, but it did really feed into the way that I practice and the way that I look at uh, different uh, spatial politics, whether they're in the kitchen or outside of it. And so that that's uh, me in a nutshell. I do want to add, uh, this is something we, we spoke about um, right before the, the talk uh, starts, um, is that... Um, we'd like for this talk to be as generative as possible for, for you all as well. And so um, beyond introductions, please feel free to ask 
about things that could lead uh, this conversation uh, in useful ways for you all as well. Definitely. Thank you, Moisa. Um, I think you you both picked up on an important thing uh, for a lot of UAE based artists, which is uh, studying abroad and, and specifically going to study some kind of fine art master's degree. Um, did you did either of you feel any sort of uh, pressure to, to go uh, in a particular direction or, you know, after completing your bachelor's and, you know, emerging into the world of work was there was it kind of this this burning pressure that you felt that you had to go and study a particular thing somewhere or was it did it happen kind of spontaneously or you know for, for both of you how did your your bachelor's feed into the 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 master's degrees that you both ended up doing so i think the general thing that i felt when i was in grad school was a big sense of disappointment i think what had unraveled for me is just how much these things become an, uh, almost like an inescapable route that one has to go through to um, accrue validation um, and, uh, and then be able to use this piece of paper to teach and to do other things. Um, you know, I've met really wonderful, um, let's say, practitioners, cultural practitioners who haven't gone down that route but are, are very much limited um, with their options because of that. And so it seems like it's this thing that you can't opt out of. That being said, the grad school obviously offers, you know, the luxury of space and time and community that I would, you know, that, that really has influenced where my practice has, has arrived at. But I, I think it's just exposing the, the duality of, of what this thing can present, I think is really important. Hmm. Um, well, this is this is interesting. Well, <clears throat> I'm not sure I was pressured to get an MFA. I every once in a while there are some certain male figures who are important in my life in terms of advice, in terms of things they've given, even though they're not part of it, generally speaking. So they're like absentee male role models. However, uh, this is another incident where my uncle said. To me, if you're going to get a master's degree, do it in something you love and don't do it for a job or a degree. And I, I naively decided, you know what? He's right. He's definitely right. I'm going to do this in something I love. And I mean, comics were coming up in the UAE. Maybe I can benefit from this, but I didn't. I plunged in. I didn't give it a second thought. And I it, honestly, I suffered for two and a half years for this plunge. But that's, you know, that's, it's all worth it for the journey in my eyes. And what I liked about grad school, and this is interesting because it's different than Moses, I had the space, I had the community, I did not have the time. Man, when you are when you have to do like, like 10, 16 pages by the end of a, a quarter, so SCAD doesn't have a semester, they have quarters, in which case you have 10 weeks, week five is midterms, week nine is final submissions, and week 10 is like reviews for those final submissions. You're just, you're running. You're just running. It's like the first, my first experience of knowing why a building is open 24 seven. Finally figured out why they do that. It's because, oh, and it's located next to a nice little uh, convenience store and a gas station. So yeah, so you, you gain, uh, gain over 10 kgs. Southern food is brilliant. And then you also break a limb or two. It's great. It's fun experience. Good for the soul. Indeed, indeed. Moza, you talk about the, the the fact that grad school offered you space time and luxury in order to kind of pursue uh you know kind of uh, and explore different uh different routes um do you think that's something that could be created outside of grad school here in the uae is there a way that that can be kind of organically created amongst artists here or what, what do you I think about that I think in, in, in programs that have this uh, mentorship aspect where things that you produce are pretty low stakes, you know, like it's all experimental, it's all within kind of like a guided environment. Uh, or if you have the kind of studio practice where people um, uh, are used to uh, visiting your studio and, and offering up um, critique or just having that kind of space. Um, uh, I, I mean, it's not luxurious, really, but I, I think the luxury in it is that there is a sense of generosity that um, 
that other people can can provide um, and that um, and that feeds back into your work um, and I find that more and more with the way that we work I mean time is an issue so so when it comes to time the the thing that I think about is if you have time it is a luxury if you have time to um, grow uh, this practice then it, it it does feel like a luxury I think residencies operate in the same ways as well um, so I think these are the opportunities really when when there's some sort of space for mentorship or for exchange. Mm. What are your thoughts on that? That's fascinating because um, really the only growth I want is in my skill. The only growth I want is knowing how to do perspective very, very well. In, like installing the figure on that perspective grid, making sure everything makes sense around the figure that it's on the ground plane, it's visibly on the ground plane. That I know what I, you know, I know what a caracobrachialis is. I know what a lettucimus dorsi is. I know where the serratus mixes in with your obliques. You know, like that's the most important thing. And I'm wondering if there were such a thing, like as a mentorship or as a equivalent of Seif. Yeah, plot twist. I didn't. I forgot I was putting Seif until Moza mentioned it, and I was like, oh yeah, I did Seif, didn't I? Um, yeah, the, the COVID cohort, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so Seif was an interesting experience in terms of that mentorship that you're talking about, Moza, because when I went to Seif, I found out I could not break out of the religion of craft. As soon as I went to Seif and I was like, okay, it's time to leave all of this behind. It's time to do something that's more experimental, more out of my realm of comfort, do some conceptual art. And then with my approach to conceptual art, it became like methodology. It became like, okay, this is going to be iterative and it's going to be better than the last one. And it's going to do this and this is going to be better. I'm going to communicate this. And it just became this thing throughout my entire Steve practice. I'm like, okay, I tried to break out of this. And yet I am in a smaller prison of craft now. The prison has shrunk and I can't get out. But I think... And and this is well. I I'm I'm a faculty fellow now at C for the second year, mm. and I think one thing I keep uh, repeating to um, the previous cohort and this cohort is if something if a program reaffirms to you that the way in which you've been working um, is the way that you want to continue working because you've tried something else, then then this is also useful. Um, tried is a strong word. Tried is a very strong word here. It feels like I couldn't even try. But carry on. I mean, yeah, so, so it's, you know, and, and then this goes back to the idea of the, the luxury of space and time is that you were able to break out of this um, and, and, and experiment with, with new things, which I think, you know, is, is quite hard to launch yourself in, especially with the kind of um, what is known to, to, to be the way to operate in an art practice here. You have to, you know, the norm is you'd have a full-time job and then you'd end up in your studio sometime after you're, you've clocked out or in the weekends or in, in whatever free time that you've had. And so to use that very precious space and time to experiment and do something that is outlandishly just um, different um, is, is almost not a possibility that is present for everyone. Mm. No, I can see that. I can de I can de sorry, I can definitely see that. It's because it's it's like it's it seems like there is a huge investment into a lot of arts programs. It seems like we are very fortunate to have an ability to go into Tashkil, for example, and do some work there or to experiment and do all that stuff. Or even if you're working remotely, you can work out of Tashkil if you have the possibility. But like it's it does seem like it's a very narrow road. It does seem like. Yes, and I'm not saying, I mean, one thing I also uh, advise anyone who, who's kind of quite younger in their practice and who uh, asks for advice, obviously not, never unsolicited, uh, but, uh, but that residencies really can provide the space and time that 
maybe you don't have to immediately launch yourself into a commitment with grad school, whether that's a financial commitment or throwing yourself in this loop of trying to fund it or try, you know, if that opportunity is not on the table, then a residency. And sometimes I would tell people, you know, a residency that even you create. So like taking, you know, time off for like, let's say two days or a week uh, where you've completely dedicated yourself to the exploration of something um, can be quite generative. And from my experience, um, residencies have been the thing that, the, the, let's say, uh, the marks in, in my practice that I've been able to shift and transition and, and take these detours. Um, and grad school, I mean, especially the, the UK system, uh, where they kind of let you lead uh, how you want your the, the, the next two years to, to run mostly. Uh, it's very different than the US system where there is a class structure and, and it's a, and you know it's, it's a bit more crowded in terms of scheduling. Um, so it did feel at some point like a residency and I had to be I had to learn how to be really proactive. Uh, and that was inside and outside of school. At, I also took the opportunity to really invest in the idea that I am in a city like London, which meant that there is so many diversity that I can um, uh, really uh, engage with. Um, and so I, I would meet up with um, other uh, art students who were there for a temporary time, specifically uh, Arab artists. Um, I would engage with black and brown communities and their platforms, their art platforms. Um, in school, I would mostly engage with my peers rather than the tutors um, and, and set up uh, shows outside of school. And, and so it was this full engagement all the time. And I think I came back with that attitude and that spirit back here where we are still building the studio culture. Um, the, I, where I'm sitting right now in my studio, I'm not going to show you because it's a hot mess, but this was supposed to be the ideal communal space. I, I might just show you a little corner of the library, um, but, but that I've created this food book library for people to access, for people to visit and, um, and to come here, have a tea, grab a book, have these conversations. I want to say that that almost never happened. Like people people would come here specifically to either talk to me or see something, but, but it hasn't become this communal space in the sense that, for example, Tashkil would have a communal space. You know, it just didn't do that. Um, and so now I occupy the communal space because I have to spread out. Um, and, and that taught me something. I, I really did uh, get into the project of setting up a solo studio space with the idea that it would not be too solo and that it would be occupied with um, my peers. Um, and that just is, is still really rare. This brings us on to uh, an, another point. You know, we've spoken about the, the institutional opportunities that we have here in the UAE, such as CIF and other uh, residency programs. But Moza, you, you're talking about setting up this studio as a as a community space, why why do you think it didn't it didn't quite happen in the way that you'd uh, imagined it? And what can we, you know, for example, thinking about in uh, Abu Dhabi, we had Beit Fifteen, and now we don't have Beit Fifteen, and we have you know Beit Al Mamzad has just started in uh, in uh, Dubai, but you know there's a lot of small things happening. But uh, how do we kind of can we connect these kind of informal networks more, or what 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 can we do to kind of activate these these spaces better? I think what we've grown used to is a top down attitude. So like when the institution initiates this kind of culture, then we all follow. And I think this is what's become problematic is that the weight, um, the, the weight for something to be initiated, for something to be announced and set up um, and all the excuses that people form for, you know, I think, um, uh, I think people go like, oh, you know, I don't want to get into the costs of things. I don't want to, you know, it is a cost, for example, setting up hospitality for people to come over and all of that, getting the studio cleaned, um, <laughs> all of these things. I've had instances where I would organize a big studio visit, say like six people, 
uh, and them all canceling on the same day after I've already had you know gotten the studio cleaned have uh, prepared uh, food and drinks and all of these things for an institution for that to happen it's not a big loss uh, and it's not a tremendous loss let's say financially but it is a hit uh, nonetheless for and and it does leave uh, artists with studios maybe a little bit jaded um, and so I think the, the, the way to probably go about it is to continue to have conversations in which we um, can generate uh, useful suggestions for how we can organize better, how we can meet up in each other's uh, studios, how we can meet up in general. And, and studios also present this uh, space of safety that I can talk about something that's not necessarily too linked to my practice, but that is important for me um, in, in some peripheral way uh, for, for my practice. That, in, that wouldn't necessarily make sense if I presented in an institution who has probably contacted me to talk about something that is very specific. Um, and um, I've had this conversation actually today with a friend uh, who was a bit frustrated uh, about an exchange that happened between them and, and uh, one of the institutions here. And, and some things that we keep repeating is, you know, don't institutions realize that they need the artists? Don't they realize that we are the ones who are kind of like the pillars of, of the place, you know, who generate content, who, you know, create interest, who uh, attract footfall? Isn't the institution built for these things? And institutions, regardless of how well-meaning they can be, the fact remains is that they know that they have the upper hand. Um, and so when we take that out of the equation entirely and we start to self-organize, I feel like even our relationships with institutions can become a bit more symbiotic in the sense that there is not that much major um, reliance uh, and institutions also start to maybe listen a little bit better because it's like, okay, well, they're all over there in that corner huddling. How can we bring them back into the space in a way that works for all of us again? Um, and really, this is, I think, the, the moment that's happening here, possibly in the UAE, at least from my perspective. Well, you brought up multiple points, and I don't know where to start because they're all tangentially related. Uh, first off, I think in terms of like people being flaky, I think that's a huge topic that has nothing to do with arts or artists. It's just a general thing we have to deal with nowadays because I personally am not a flaky person if I commit to something Finn is witness to it if I commit to something I will be there and I will show up irrelevant what topic is in fact having said that my friend Abdullah and I had a long-standing movie night every well it used to be Thursday now we moved to Friday we did that for about a year and a half until the situation has changed. But we did that for about a year and a half. Every Friday, no matter what, unless I'm traveling or he's traveling, every Friday or Thursday back in the day, no matter what, we'd come, we'd watch a movie, sometimes watch two movies, ha have a small chat, discuss the films, and then go home. And that was a longstanding thing. And we were able to do it for, like again, for over a year and a half. And I think when I think about my drawing group, friend of, a few friends of mine, who some of them are in the Corniche book, Right. When I set up a drawing thing, I make sure to confirm with all of them, like, okay, guys, this is what's going to happen. Feel free to show up or don't show up. But the, and it's the consistent people that always show up. And it's been, we've just had one like last month. We had a little artist gathering for drawings and drawing comics, and we bring books and we discuss topics. So, I, again, I think this is, this ends up being the people you surround yourself with and accepting that maybe part of their personality is just not being commitment. Uh, incentivized I don't know if that's a nice word for it commitment incentivized but I don't know if we can also place that blame on the institution either I think I think there there has to be some giveaway or there has to be some form of challenge so if you are a person who's like okay the institutions aren't doing that we should do this on our own we should create a disruptance of some sort we will create our own space our own thing and then everyone goes there. And if you have a group of committed people and they're all willing to show up, then you've already showed up the institution. You've already secured yourself a, an evening or a space or a, a, what do they call them? You remember, remember happenings, guys? Remember happenings back in the 60s? Yeah, happenings, dude. So like happenings that are, you know, 
that are outside the institutions, not funded by the institutions. People show up and bring their whatever they have with them. And it can be a safe space if it's agreed upon that we can talk about whatever we want or we can discuss whatever we want. So I do see this as more like the community should step up and look, I mean, if we if we all decide collectively to say to hell with the institutions, we should be able to do that. But I mean, those are my two cents. Again, they're fragmented because there's so many tangential points. Um yeah, but I think it's it is it is a burden, no? Because uh, if I am busy self organizing, like with a with a group of people who are committed or not, then I am taking time away from my own practice. And then I um, I think the risk here is that I am known to be the artist who is you know constantly resisting the institution or constantly. Um, just having something to say. Uh, rebel. Instead of being the artist who's known for their practice and is able to kind of create a communicative element uh, or a communicative relationship through my practice rather than through um, these kind of like organizational skills. Um, I think there, I think it's important, but I, at the moment, I don't think there's a, a shared responsibility. And so you have like a few people who you can kind of like count on that they'll like say something every now and then, but there's no, the, I think the sense of community is still shifting because we're still uh, establishing, uh, um, you know, th these things that seem like they're new, but they're not like a, a, a healthy, active studio culture is still a struggle. I mean, I, I mean, I, I'd love for, for you guys to get involved if you have this struggle too, but I, I mean, I've heard it from a lot of my peers too, that, you know, even trying to organize to have curators over or, you know, just hosting an open studio or whatever, like it's, why, why is that like the struggle that we're having? There seems to, you know, um, and then this, I, you know, this doesn't devalue anyone's practice really, but um, this still presents the case that we have to be reliant uh, on something bigger to create these things for us because we're unable to be, we're, we're, un, we're just not successful in, in uh, gathering enough uh, interest or people or um, conversations that we need to be having. Do you feel a pressure to be constantly kind of switched on as, a, as an artist and to be your kind of artist persona constantly, you know? Uh, can an artist community revolve around things that aren't art? You know, could people yes. come together? Okay. Yeah, they're called movie nights, man. Yeah, come, no, there's but, pizza. But, yeah. No, but exactly, this is it. I mean, uh, uh, I'll use the example of, of Sif again, the, the previous, uh, cohort, for uh, for example, led reading groups, screenings. Uh, one person led a workshop on how to read cinema, and this is, you know, this is quite broad and and can be a bit vague and not really about the person's practice per se, but it does help in in uh, conversations that can be educational for someone else that possibly didn't look at at things in a certain way and. And I think builds a sense of collectiveness. I think when you focus on your art persona, this uh, this then detours into a more uh, like encouraging the in the individualistic way of of being. And I think right now that can be quite destructive for like the kind of community that we wish to build here. I mean, when you say art persona. That's that's a farcical facade to me. I'm like, I don't have an artist persona. I'm obstreperous and I'm loud and I just carry myself the same way. Like I, no, but I know, like I possibly maybe Finn, what you're saying is that some people really, really do brand themselves though, um, and that's not a negative thing. Like it, it's kind of like okay, this you know, it's I think it's also like maybe a survival thing too. Like you want to be known directly for the thing that you do. Uh, like, like perfume, yeah. like a like perfume, like Chanel by Momo. I smell <laughs> because I care. Chanel by Momo. This is my uh, art. No, I mean, but I was, yeah. I was thinking along the lines of like Moza. You know, you 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 have your studio. It's you want it to be as open as possible. But 
do you think there is a pressure for people to when they're coming it has to be for some kind of a studio visit or it has to be um, some kind of formal occasion could it not just be people coming to hang out you know yes. is, is there a, a, a kind of a struggle between those two I think people not engaging as much puts pressure on what these studio visits then have to become. Because if people are engaging, let's say people uh, feel like they're free to come by on a weekly basis, like let's say Thursdays is movie nights, then, then it becomes that. And then, you know, whatever, whatever it is, we can start to go into these tangents. I feel like that brings us back into the loop of, of something that is useful. Um, for all of us or not but but it, it's still I feel like it can still aid in this kind of like community building um, uh, endeavor that I seem to be on. Evan, um, Evan asked what is in the way of healthy studio culture? Yes. I, yes. I, I know you I know you're talking about I that. I think so. flakiness flakiness maybe is in the I think yeah lack of commitment um, maybe this this can stem from you know uh, maybe flakiness is not a, is a very petty way of saying it. but but I think it's more maybe because we're focused on like branding ourselves and and presenting ourselves in a certain way that we kind of like have these missteps in how to form a collective and you think that oh if I cancel on this person and not show up after I've said I'd show up you know two other people are going to. Well, Evan uh, touched another point. Does proximity to others have anything to do with it too? I mean, it depends, right? So I'm the type of person, if Moza told me, for example, you, you can show up at my studio in Sharjah at this time. So I reside in Dubai. I mean, it's Moza, so of course I'm going to show up. You know what I mean? I'll make the drive. It's not a problem. Same as with Corniche. Like the only thing that stopped me from going to Sharjah this time was the, I had a lot of meetings, a lot of work during the time of, of the meetup. And one night, one time I had to go to Abu Dhabi. But the point is like, I mean, even if Moza, even if Moza said, come see the studio space and see if, in Abu Dhabi, for example, I'd make the day, like I'd make the day journey to go see that. I'd do it for Finn. And I do it for like most of my, art friends if they wanted to i've done it multiple times i don't see a problem with distance i know it sucks sometimes i'm not gonna lie but I, I do i mean i'm right by the foundation people make it you know if people i feel like when i say charge it's like oh she's just all the way out you know of, Moza. Of, Moza, i'm sorry but people come it's to Sharjah Sharjah. Art i don't care it's, it's um, yeah, but I can say like it's Dubai. Like I feel like I have to be dragged, kicking and screaming to come to Dubai too. Like, you but know, it's I'm... fun, and it's great. Dubai Dar al Hay. Anyway, um, I I think I think people can tell themselves whatever. I see people going to art studios all the way in like Khorfa Khan when they really want to. You know what I mean? Like, no, I know. I, when you said flaky, you're like maybe that's petty. I'm like it's petty, but it's not incorrect. But having said that, again, it's I, I do think this is uh, like it's, it's beyond it's, it's something beyond our control. It's generally something beyond our control. So I'd much rather think of you things really like, think so. I, I mean, so I can't force anyone to change their ways or methods. No, but I think maybe if we create an era of exchange. So something I've been trying out uh, is reaching out to people whenever I'm in another Gulf country more recently Bahrain and, and Oman, but, but more specifically in Bahrain, I've really made it a point to identify certain artists, especially those where my practice aligns with, or not, not really, but, but that was especially the case in the beginning, and organized studio visits and made, or, or a meetup where we'd have tea and, and discuss things, and, um, and people were quite receptive, and um, and obviously you can say, yeah, Bahrain, you know, it's smaller, probably people do uh, get, uh, can get a bit more excited about these things than, than here because there's so much going on here all the time. But I think people, you know, have a better chance of appreciating uh, this exchange of like, you know, let's do a studio visit exchange. So it's not just come to Moses studio and, and satisfy Moses ego <laughs> and read her books. It can also be like, yeah, do come to Moza's studio, but let's also meet to talk about your work, or you, or you can bring your work here. Yeah, yes, exactly, reciprocity. Here's a question: Is 
the concept of a studio visit or a healthy studio culture is that something that we've just imported from from somewhere else and is the reason why it doesn't work or isn't seeming to work here is it because it's not um you know something that we've developed from the ground up here that is more i, think, um, in, I don't know fan i, I don't know fan it it seems like we're arguing against uh people wanting to form tribes or people wanting to find their own ilk and i believe that's been going on for like hundreds of thousands of years since we sat around the fires man i think uh -huh. that's <laughs> no because i think that's a primal thing to find your I own you know, your spirit yeah yeah, yeah. I, mean, maybe, I mean sorry oh someone wants to does someone want to speak please do was that arwa arwa please say something <laughs> Arwa, are you are you speaking to skynet was that the was that the attempt no i was shifting from my ipad to my cell phone <laughs> oh no the feedback loop <laughs> yes sorry no worries i got excited i was like yay Arwa wants to interject um <laughs> no but uh, can i can i say something first if you don't mind um, Please. look i like the idea of drawing groups when i started going to drawing groups Right. I won't say the name of the drawing groups that I went to, to in Savannah because it might entail for some activity that's not that's frowned upon. However, uh, there were, we, we had drawing groups where we'd get together once a week and we started doing that. And some people came and then some people fell off, but some people were consistent. Mm -hmm. However, what I found was if we came with purpose, so if we, found, if we all came with like, here's what we're going to do. This is a drawing group. It's supposed to be fun, whatever, but we are going to critique each other's work in class. We're going to help each other out with layouts, with the tight roughs, that kind of stuff. And we got books for references to what we needed to see. Oh, you need to look at this French guy. He's doing what you want to do, but like 500,000 times better. And in terms of that, I found it to be successful. The people who want to stick around stuck around. And it was a thing that I loved so much that I tried to emulate at least to do it here. But, you know, we i don't think it's i don't think it's as easy because uh, a lot of the i mean i'm i mean it's, but it's, it's strange bit... no because it's like because we do have like at the very least what survived from from you know what you were saying about how people gather is like the majlis culture no or you, you yeah. know it, it could have been it could have been called a healthy majlis practice or uh, or <laughs> you know or a salon or you know like i, I think people we have to define what healthy is we have to define what you mean by healthy yeah, let's, yeah, studio. Let's, let's, go ahead tell me what you mean by that healthy i think is just you know it is um, a sense of commitment, a sense of uh, engagement, even if it's not like 100%, but that um, I think engagement maybe is a better way of uh, that we, whether we agree with each other's practices or not is irrelevant, but that if I dislike your practice, it's because I know what your practice is. It's not because I've just formed this really quick opinion because I've seen something passively on social media which has become the way that we we're, we're in we're interacting with people's practices in these spaces of distraction which is mainly our phone um and we see when a lot of people kind of get this either applause or silence you know uh, just tumbleweeds you know and 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 then we <laughs> you know and this is how we're able to gauge somehow that someone's practice is meaningful or not and not because we've you know um we've actually interacted with them and i'm you know i, I obviously don't want to name any names but there are practices that seem like they are just um just these incredible practices but um you know it's where it's hard to separate the artist from the practice because they're so intertwined in the way that they present uh themselves um and once you you know and, and once you either engage with either or and it's like oh the artist is not there to talk about their work and i feel differently about their work like this starts to form different ways of critique different ways of community coming together do i care to go back to this artist to have more conversations about their work where we uh you know we're working at the same time in the same environment more or less we're part of the same history that's being uh, built at, at this moment and so do i care that i am part of the narrative of this time and space with this artist yes i do and so 
um, I, I take these things really seriously. And this is why sometimes when I, um, when I, I get really passionate about, about when people just engage really on a surface level and are quick to either applaud or critique something based on the surface level interaction. And so maybe healthy for me is a true engagement, um, you know, reaching out, uh, those visits, uh, whatever it is. Healthy for me, an example. I hate your work because I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> Simple and done. I don't know. Um, again, my practice is so far removed. It's consistent. It's consistently incongruous with a lot of uh, the general arts practice here because uh, I suppose it's a lot easier for me in the sense of like when I think of a healthy arts practice, I just think of someone coming in, looking at my work and getting a, a step shy from ripping it apart. Just a step, like a hair away from ripping the page, just giving me, just giving me the absolute most straightforward, frank uh, feedback on to how to improve a page. That to me is what I would consider a healthy studio environment, but I don't know if it's also applicable to say a healthy gathering for other artists or studio visits. Like, I don't think that's a- And we won't identify those way. things if we don't interact so it's like if i know like i know some of my are uh, some of my peers who have clearly said i'm not inviting you here for critique but we can talk about anything else and that is just as valid as someone who's like i've only invited you here for critique um because it's engagement in 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 both ways uh we're still talking about um things that concern us, whether it's the work itself or things that we are responding to as artists or, you know, frustrations, uh, moments of joy, whatever it is, I think, I think it's not, it's not just critique. Sure. But I, 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 yeah, no, but I understand. I understand what you mean by healthy, but then like, that's a communal gathering and not so much as, because I'm, I'm trying to just, dis, to dif distinguish between like the purpose of the communal art gatherings. Are we doing this to improve and collectively do some work and help improve our skills, our thought processes, our biases, all that stuff? Or are we doing this to, you know, hang out? Let's watch movie night and have pizza. But you improvement know? can be beyond the work itself. Like for me to have learned uh, something that maybe someone wants to bring up something that they've read that I have never heard of and we're not really talking about the work like that can also be I mean to bring it back to the title of this talk <laughs> which is generative art practices I'm sorry if, <laughs> if we didn't get into like the financial aspects That's okay. but, <laughs> but but more but more from this side I think I think um yeah, for me, it, it helped when I uh, even to gather socially with the, with the group of artists, the art uh, students in London for, the, for a period of two years where it was completely social. We'd have guest speakers uh, come in at times to tell us uh, to discuss certain things. We'd have talking points and things we felt we needed to bring up while we were away um, was just as useful as uh, someone coming into my studio at school and, and looking at my work and asking me a bunch of questions. And, and well, the reason I want to make, bring the distinction up is because if I'm hanging out with my friends, I'm hanging out with my friends. It's not part of my art practice at all. When I'm doing my art, when I'm performing the arts practice, when it is about art practice, it is about the work. It is about improvement. And it's about how do I make this drawing better? How do I make this shot call better? What do I need to improve? That is what the terms of, well, I want to say generative, but if it's about comics and anime, it's clearly degenerative, in my opinion, <laughs> about what I do. And outside of that, I don't like hanging out with my friends is fine. But if I'm talking about my arts practice, I don't have time to discuss something that is not directly related to the work because time is valuable, as we spoke about in terms of time and the practice of the, of the work, like the time is valuable. And so in, in the context of a generative or degenerative arts practice for me, it has to be involved in some form of critique or a gathering where we're all doing pages. 
But Otherwise, Momo, I, I know this about you. And that's why when you come to my studio, I show you something so we can talk about that thing. You know oh, what no, I mean? You're amazing. And, like, no, you don't no, have but, to show me but, anything. No, no but, our, no, but our engagement has led me to this understanding. And this is what I mean. If, but not everyone's like that. So like, no, that's you what know, I'm, yeah. So, so for me, like engaging with someone else where we just talk about things that we've read can also be generative, just not, a, you know what I mean? So it's understanding yeah. each other on those planes. Talking about time is a, is a great segue actually into um, how I, cause I, I see you two as it, it's a, it's a nice opportunity to compare and contrast, you know, Moza, you have a full-time studio practice and uh, Momo on the, on the, on the other hand, you have a full-time job and your kind of personal art practice is obviously very much interlinked with your, with your work, but but you know you 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 also pursue uh, you know your personal pursuits out, outside of that. So, Momo, you 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 also were saying that you don't feel that you have time, um, or that if you are going to attend some kind of uh, gathering or critique session, that it, it has to be valuable in some way because. Well, you, no, to be to clarify, time is precious. If, Go on. To clarify, if it's if it's in the context of my arts practice, mm. like if it's if if I'm in art practice mode. Then yes, okay. it has to be valuable time. But I'm not opposed. But I'm not opposed to hanging out, you know, like having my friends over and hanging out and discussing stuff. Because, like Moses said, as much as I am like want to admit it, she she does have a good point that every movie night I've learned something in terms of shot calls, lighting, okay. or storytelling. So it does it does feed into my practice one way or another. But I, I like to I like to separate them so I can try to switch off. I never switch off, but I try to switch off a bit more when I'm around friends. I see. I see. So do you find it difficult to to make that distinction? I mean, Moza, do you? Because you seem you're, you're very eloquent about this, whereas I'm searching for words. <laughs> No, I don't, but the distinction when it comes to like these two types of interactions, I think for me, because I've, this is the way that I've been engaging with people, it, it hasn't, I, I, I tend to think that the way that I exist has entangled itself so much with, with the way that I work, the way that I am and the way that I work is just so intertwined that it, it all has to feed back into what I do and what I think. Um, so, and maybe this is because I don't have to compartmentalize so much because everything that I do is, so yeah, I run a, uh, my, my practice full time, um, but I also teach um, uh, and, and which is really at a part-time capacity in terms of, uh, as far as time goes. And uh, when the weather is better, I'm a licensed food tour guide um and so and that and so, all feeds back right that all yeah, feeds, that back, all into feeds your back I mean sometimes do I really feel like I want to uh, meet a group of strangers and tell them about food in Dubai sometimes I don't like because it's a script that I have to keep repeating but uh, but somehow it's a muscle that I exercise no it's a, it's a storytelling muscle that goes back into the way that I work it's also something that I um can critique and can um uh, the way that I narrate uh, has become something that I've, I've uh, been doing in, in my work, in my films, and, and it's all this big loop, um, and whatever I add to it continues to become this big loop, and I want to say that I do run my studio full-time slightly by choice. Um, I, I've been throwing my name in, in different hats for a kind of like a nine-to-five situation, um, you know, the, just so I don't glamorize this this way of working, um, and it just hasn't come up uh, at at the moment. And so it's it's a blessing and a curse. The blessing is I'm able to sustain myself through my practice and through these kind of uh, side uh, projects that end up feeding into my work, both financially and uh, and into you know conceptually. Um, uh, and so, and so, I think the momentum that my practice has found itself on um, or in, um, it really, you know, it it that time afford, afforded it that momentum. Um, because of the constraints of work, because I'm the opposite end of the coin, 
I've thrown myself into two figure drawing mentorships and they're completely different approaches. But one is for 12 weeks. I have 10 more weeks of that. And then I start one mid-October towards a bit later that's going to go on for a year. And this is directly coming after writing mentorship. Of course, this is all comics related. But that's like, yeah. that's what I do out of my, yeah. That's, what I, that's how I maintain my sanity about my practice. One thing I want to say is also this way of working has really opened my eyes to the value of a studio practice not being an individual endeavor too. And the value of when I do get the opportunity to, to achieve a more financial stability that assistantships are definitely going to be in the works, um, you know, involving people into uh, my studio practice. Uh, for research purposes, because it, it very a big part of my practice is research and and all of that. So so I think it it's been uh, definitely um, valuable in terms of what I've learned um, about how I want to continue being the artist that I want want to be. Um, and so it's really just being adaptive. I think when you know when i think about what i really need at this very moment is the sense of community um you know we work in a really i suppose this really blurry uh, space um you, you know we're such a diverse community you want to you want to be having a lot more open conversations you want to be able to navigate space in a way that's uh responsible and, and and so I think I think for me you know uh, being able to be open about these things by having an, an open studio format then really helps me in moving forward in, in the work you know um, I don't know like I don't know for, for a moment um, I need to yeah I'm trying to think about it for me it's uh... Hope against hope that someone knows who Alex Toth is and we can have a conversation about black placement and like shot calls. But I don't know. I think I try my best to be to set myself up in a mentorship position where I've told everyone who wants to be involved in comics, even Corniche, if you if you want any, to know anything about comics, reach out to me. I've told this to students multiple times, people who are taking visual narrative classes. I'm like, I am available to anyone who wants to know more about comics. If you want to learn more about the storytelling aspects of it, the drawing aspects of it, just reach out and I will make the time for you. I will def sit you down. We'll have a conversation. I'll help you out in that kind of regards. That's the thing. My only, like, I think that's a contribution, I suppose, to the practice here, but yeah, no, not a lot of people take the offer. Yeah. I think that's, I think this is, this is the struggle and we keep going back to, maybe we should open this up now. <laughs> final that question. Yes. Actually, uh, one one final question on that point is: there, Do you think, as as artists that are working full time, you know, either with a studio practice or with a you know work that's very closely related to your own practice, is there is there such thing as as a work life balance? And how do you how do you find the time for yourself? And you know, make sure not to overstretch yourself, and you know, practice uh, self care. For example, this is you can sleep when you're dead. You're asking the wrong people. <laughs> no, and it's not because I like, I don't think it's because we're constantly working. I, I mean, at least I'll speak for myself. It's because we have become completely obsessed with the things that we are interested in. And I hate to use this word quite liberally, but I think I, I also you know don't it's know true. Describe, yeah, I don't search know your how... soul, search within yourself. You know, you're obsessed. <laughs> no, no, yeah, and, and I think for me, every time I go on an excursion, even if it's like, oh, I need time away from the studio, let me go on this excursion, it turns into a research trip. Um, and, and so, yeah, I think uh, the, the work-life balance is this is my work and my life, and I, I no longer can, which is, you know, again, not a prescription on how like an art practice should be, I think, you know, at all. Um, but I think maybe I can attribute this to uh, artistic expression, if I'm just going to completely dilute this and romanticize it, but artistic expression being like this very human act. It's not, it's not a, a, a capitalistic, it can be, but it's not this kind of like capitalistic, it doesn't have these capitalistic origins, let's say. 
Um, and so from the beginning of time immemorial, like people have been expressing themselves through these really human basic ways. Um, and that it's very much um, aligned with their spiritual belief or who they are, how they live, their survival, their needs for survival, all, all those things. And so for someone who, for example, just wants to weave, you know, that's their work and their life. Uh, but if someone then wants to, let's say, sell those uh, pieces, then then the, the way in which they run that business or they run that kind of project where that generates income can can be a bit separated in terms of like what you look, what you categorize as work and what you categorize as life. Yeah, I don't think I've ever drawn a page to sell it. I don't think I've ever done that or done a mini comic or done any of that to sell them. I think it's been just like, okay, done, not perfect. Next one has to be better. Next page, done, not perfect. This next one has to be better. I'm, I'm hugely motivated by just the, just pushing my limits and seeing how far I can go in terms of my skill sets, or at least I hope so. It's a pretty esoteric kind of question. But I agree with Moza for the most part. I do agree with her completely. I think the obsession is part of it. And I don't, I don't see there's, I don't see that as a problem. I'm not saying that you have to work 24 hours a day. Like I, what I do is I make sure I have three days in the week where I go to the gym because I'm as big as the horizon and I'm shrinking. And so, you know, three days in the gym, every day I try to sequester two to three hours. Mostly I get away with one, one and a half, but I try to sequester three hours for myself to draw. And if there's time, coffee with a friend or I'm, while I'm having coffee, I'm drawing with a friend. Like I try my best to do that. But sometimes work comes in. Sometimes you're going to burn the midnight oil. Sometimes it just it pulls over. And I suppose as, as long as you, you don't have to be perfect about this, but I think as long as you try your best to maintain some time for sanity, some time for your practice, and then a cutoff point where you're like, okay, I'm done with work for today. I'm going to put this away. I'm now going to start what I want to do for myself. A couple of hours. Okay, I'm done with this. Now I want to just relax and sleep. Yeah. I think, that, I think it's, I think it's possible. I think it's difficult, specifically since most artists tend to be like, um, like if you, if, if you believe the stuff of like the, the big five personality traits, most artists don't fall under orderliness. <laughs> if you're an artist, you're mostly on the openness side. Like orderliness is a bit, it's a bit of a strange thing to do. I mean, you can shift there. You can become orderly, but like, it's a bit of a challenge. It's not part of my nature to be like strict and orderly and disciplined. The military helped a bit with that, but not much. I mean, I just want to add quickly that, you know, I do fantasize about coming to the studio and not answering emails and not putting together proposals or filling in applications or doing my own accounting and... Kafu. But I do. This is what I find myself doing on a daily basis. And all I want to do is, you know, some some sketches for upcoming work. I've, I've even tried to trick myself by printing these stills of, of a film that I want to work on and plaster them on the wall in front of me to, you know, just incentivize me to to do this. And I uh, and I am just completely uh, caught up with the admin side of things so this is where the work in the in the in the work life balance hey if you want a draw uh, session moza just say when i'd be more than happy to sit and draw and watch you draw be more than happy no, to do that and that's a dream that's become a dream like this is what i fantasize about and this is what i get fatigued with uh, you know I'm, I'm facing studio fatigue because i come here and it's like okay well time to put together a timeline for this project and 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 then get completely burnt out by these tasks and call it a day. Fair enough. <laughs> so thank you guys. Uh, we have a comment from uh, Dima. Uh, she says, I believe a main need for artists and creatives is randomness by being in contact with the unlikely. Differences mm. is such a sweet spot and an inspiring force that some artists need. I'm wondering what places in the UAE can offer that. Ah. Amsterdam. <laughs> places in the UAE that offer kind of like these spaces and I think maybe this is ideally 
other people's studios. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I, a friend of mine once uh, gave this, I'm not, I'm going to butcher it, but gave this analogy of like the cat and the bull, where like the cat, the, the, you know, the cat is this creature that can go all over and is constantly encountering things and has the space of randomness. And the bull doesn't have necessarily the same way of, of being. And both are like valid ways of, <laughs> of, of being and working um, because they ensure the survival of each or even the death of each, but, but like the, the way in which the, these two exist. And when I think about, you know, spaces of randomness or spaces of focus, I tend to think about uh, you know, institutions being the spaces of, of focus, like, you know, and, and their workshops and their libraries and their programs and the spaces of randomness where you can kind of encounter more accidental information or encounters are the spaces in which we create ourselves amongst each other. I don't know if this is a good answer. Spaces of randomness, I'm trying to think. My work practice mostly constitutes of consuming a ton of media. When I say a ton of media, I mean an obscene amount of media. Just to see how people view storytelling, to see the different aspects of approach, to whether it's like technical, boring jargon. But a place of randomness for me, it's usually, uh, I usually pick a random genre. Like even when it comes to comics, in terms of my personal practice, I don't know about the rest of them, but like if you're an artist and you're an illustrator and your your work is about illustration and it's about representing the world in line, it, I mean, it won't do you any harm to go to the library and just pick up a random graphic novel or pick up a random book and see what you like and don't like about it. And you can do that as often enough. In fact, a one of the practices, uh, I forget which writer said, is go to the library, go to the section that you feel like you want to go into and just pull a book out. And just read that book and see if it's if it gives an interesting idea for a story, and you'll be surprised how often that works. And so for me, the, the interaction with randomness has to be of me going like, "All right, there's this artist. Is he dead? No, he's not dead. Okay, what did he do yesterday? Oh, okay. I don't know. He had three books out. Let me read them. I suppose initiative then, and In initiative <laughs> pro pro proactiveness. <laughs> I mean, I think you have to be proactive for your artist. <laughs> what a task. <laughs> yeah, I think you have to be proactive, though. Was, I mean, I, I, think, I think the more proactive you are, the more information your subconscious is going to digest when it gives you an idea in the shower. What you're saying is what I do when I go on all these excursions, even when it's I- precisely, you, you're, you're active I in it. Encounter a farmer who changes my life, you know, like, so- Yeah, 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 no, you're, yeah. You're, you're, you're actively practicing. And I don't think, like, it, it's, 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 you know, it's a part of craft. I don't think it's applicable to one type of drawing or one another. I think it's right. applicable to everything. But, uh, you know, being active is necessary. Indeed. <laughs> Unfortunately. All right, we have a question from Evan. Uh, he says, curious what mindsets help you create a sustainable praxis without being fixated on the commercial end? What do you guys think? Uh, um, unfortunately, I don't have a commercial bone in my body, which you know is uh, really unfortunate for my gallerist who's unable to sell my work. Um, but I've managed to uh, garner the interest of certain institutions who find value in, in commissioning my work. Um, and so I think from, the, from early on, I, I've been able to identify where the spaces of, of communicativeness that I've spoken about make sense for my work. And so certain museums, let's say, or, or, or cultural institutions uh, would do that in a, in a better way than let's say a commercial gallery. And so yeah. what, yeah, what ends up happening is then I would get support for production and, and, and like get, you know, the artist fee in that way rather than selling editions of work. That being said, my, you know, I, I'm represented by a platform called Hunna. Um, and it's, it's still an online space. And so um, the person who's running it, Ossian Seli, uh, is someone who 
uh, you know, has just incredible faith in, in what I do and was able to just like price my work. I, I couldn't have ever <laughs> done it because I don't know like what the criteria is. And so I, again, I think this is another aspect of community coming together is someone, you know, the, the curator from the institution who kind of believes in your work, the gallerist who's setting up a new gallery or, or is part of an older gallery who sees the value of your work and kind of come in to do this where you don't have to be the accountant, the um, organizer, the marketer of your work, you know, you just, you, you don't have to wear all these different hats all the time. You how still, dare you, Moza? How you dare you? How, do, no. how dare you not be your own accountant, financier, marketing, I am, agent, uh, editor, sound designer, etc.? But I, and, and this is, you know, maybe I've taken up this attitude because I do my own camera work when I'm filming and I do my own editing and, and everything. And, and this becomes Part, becomes part of the work but I also then have grown used to doing all these roles but what I'm saying is you don't have to I don't know if this is answering the question let me just read it again but um but maybe yeah the the mindset that helps me create a sustainable practice is uh, is actually just trying to be as realistic as possible like my work is not selling then I have to find other ways of, of, of working and creating, which is uh, really strengthening these relationships with institutions that help keep me kind of like in the role of, of making. And so I'm currently still working with a research grant that I've received from Warehouse 421. It's an artistic research grant that has helped to completely fund my research for the entire year. So something like that, obviously, uh, takes off the weight of all these excursions that I have to go on in terms of transportation, accommodation, um, participating in, in, in certain things that um, feed into this research. Um, so I think if I was uh, focused on why my work wasn't selling, I would find myself not being able to generate any kind of, uh, let's say, way of, of not generating income really, but generating another another way of, um, you know, fi financial aspect that helps the work uh, grow and helps and helps keep my practice sustained. You right. mentioned, uh, Moza, sorry, Mama, just uh, quickly to pick up on this, the, the this relationships that, that you have with institutions that commission projects um and and you you, you said earlier about uh, establishing a kind of a symbiotic relationship that artists need to do this with uh you know with these with these larger uh, groups um do you think that they inform the kinds of projects that you end up doing because you know you've got like oh there's this grant available do you do you kind of feel yourself conforming in a kind of way. I don't know whether that's that's the right word, but you no, know, yeah, yeah, yeah that's a good question. Yeah. yeah, I think uh, so. I think where we stand right now, it's uh, it's um, we've arrived at a point where institutions listen to what what artists feel is urgent, uh, because I think when things started to get picked up again here, it was within the realm of soft power. No, so it was topics of identity, like certain thematics that push uh, certain agendas through in terms of arts and culture. And now I think things, there's room for that. And so it has become a yes and environment where it's like, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of work about, you know, things that are globally urgent, a, a, lot, of, um, a lot of initiatives on responding to climate, the climate crisis, for example, and, and stuff like that. And I think, um, I, so what I what I uh, tend to push for is that there there needs to be this ecosystem of different artists working in different ways. So those who do create the type of art that goes and you know to to different embassies, let's say, and, and kind of like is um, you know present themselves in, in certain ways, and then there are uh, there's um, other types of art that are a bit less uh, about. Uh, what um, what you were saying, which is, you know, what is the interest of the place, let's say, um, and, and how artists just need to respond to that. I really don't find that to be the case, even when in, in my um, mentorship role, uh, 
I find that people are very much uh, just responding to time and space in very personal ways um, and not really looking at like market value of certain ways of practicing and uh, and I don't know if that's to their detriment <laughs> but <laughs> Um, but, but I don't think it's stopping anyone. If anything, I think it, it, it seems like it's more hopeful that we're, um, you know, on that route. Um, I think the conversations we do need to have to have a more symbiotic relationship is, um, I think we need to have less celebratory talks about what everyone is achieving, whether it's the artist or the institution, um, or the foundation or whatever um. no I think we I think the, the the time has come for more more honest and open talks about you know um, you know just you know what are not just the struggles that that uh, art practice faces at the moment but really you know that that could be an example of like, how do we come together in, in those ways? I think what's taking up space is this constant state of celebration. Um, do you really think that's what it is? Like, it's, it's always this. It's one of the, I think it's one of the things So you, you, you know, I think asking people for their time and gathering people in a space to just kind of, you know, sing the praises of either someone's uh, practice or, um, or, or the opportunities that are presented. I think that's important, but that's already been established. I think now is a time where, well, how do we, you know, how, is there something we're not talking about that there needs to be more exhibitions about, you know, just for example. Um, where do you think that starts? How do you think we can we can go about doing that? I suppose it's a, it's a huge topic, but. It's a chicken and egg situation, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because uh, I had a, I had a private conversation with a curator who I've kind of you know butt heads with at at a point because I was bringing this up, and they said that uh, well I think artists should take their demands to the institution. I said I think artists should make art. Uh, you know like I I I feel like there should be less demand on the artist on what and and we already have spoken about being proactive and doing all these things and. There's only so so many hats we can wear. <laughs> yeah, but Moza, like the the demand also comes in from the institutions. I mean, I understand why it's a chicken and egg situation because you wouldn't like the the open calls have th themes. The open calls require you to do something and be active in a particular direction or way. And so, like, where where does that even stop? That's the no, huge but point. But institutions of support. institutions basically are made up by a group of people. And mostly we know one or two people like, or they're just one of us, whether we know them or not. Like we yeah. know that someone has, you know, is basically there, but really what they want to do is be in their own studio and make their own work. And so they're putting these programs out and these workshops out or these talks or whatever, organizing for the institution in hopes that they create the space that they wish to occupy themselves. Yeah, but again, and chicken so, egg. Yeah, and so and so, why why is it so hard to kind of just place the weight on these expectations? Where if there's enough of us in there already, you know, and I know like they're already do, doing so. You much, want unions, Moza? You want unions? What are you no, talking about? No, but I'm about? saying like at, at the very least, they're also you know cushioned by a disposable income, cushioned by um, you know kind of having that kind of stability. Um, that can allow for, you know for, for them and, and and also the the environment of the institution that grants them access to certain artists that come through certain practices yeah. that there's a, their... there's a lot of benevolence from the institutions that you know that we require if we're not earning our own cushy job money yeah exactly so so i don't think it's really unfair to kind of you know shift the scales in that way um because they do come from the space of understanding it's no longer just like this you know business-minded ceo person who's running an, an, an arts and culture you know there's there's enough people in there i think uh, who come from similar experiences is that how we keep this symbiotic relationship going then is that you know personal relationships with people on the inside as as, a, as, a, as it were 
Yes, I mean, but in. if you can get me in and get me some uh, some nice paper, I'd be obliged. So. <laughs> no, but then, but but it's then easier to connect, isn't it? And also, I think then the institution has two responsibilities: one, to hire enough people who are of that background and understanding, and two, provide them the space to be the artist they they hired them for. Like they they hired this person because they're an artist that person should have the space and time to practice as and I believe that then makes them you know really useful in their job because I don't know this is a risk man you're talking about something risky because you're not looking at it from the point of uh, the proliferation of nepotism the proliferation of the tastemakers and deciding who's you know like oh my buddy's work is so good I'm gonna put him in like that's that's always another aspect to consider no, I, but I don't think that's how people are getting hired. I mean, from my from what I know, people. I'm not saying that's how people get hired. I'm saying, but like you know, you know, this is a thing that that does occur. It's not like it doesn't occur. It does occur. I'm not not naming names because I can't get you know. This isn't a factual statement as much as it's an observation and anecdotal evidence. But we know this. You know this. Finn knows this. I think most people know this. There's an element of that happening, and if it proliferates, then where where do we go? But this is a, this is a global thing, right? Yeah. It's, it's one hundred percent global thing. It's not a problem that's you know specific. No, no, no. I'm not saying this is yeah, specific. Yeah, yeah, I'm talking no, about. I know, but... I'm talking about the the mechanism and the after effect. I'm like the phenomenon mm-hmm. exists. Yeah. And... yeah, but I still feel like I still feel like th- this can be one of the ways in which we can go about things. Uh, is that you know we we more or less can draw from these similarities to create these um, relationships? No, no, I don't. I mean, I don't disagree. I don't disagree. I mean, that there has to be someone who can, you know, push from the, for their community. And you can think about it from a larger sense, not just like oh, to get certain artists who create. No, I'm talking about a community. I'm talking for example, about like, like you know, and decolonizing an institution then needs to look at uh, having enough diversity. Um, in a meaningful way and in you you know and so it's not really about you know um, having one or like a few type of uh, of of artists to suddenly show up in the institution and and be recycled in them all the time no 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 what we need is to have a group of artists who all wear Yeezys those are the group of artists who are going to exhibit in my artist uh imaginary academy or whatever but i get it i get it it's just it's 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 immensely complex and it's a multivariate problem because it, there are there's so many things that could come in and uh, you know circumvent or derail all right well we're coming up for seven and so if anyone has any questions now would be the time to to please ask them um but, or forever uh, hold your peace. Exactly. <laughs> but uh, yeah, perhaps uh, Momo and, and Moza, if just as a kind of final thought, if you had, uh, knowing the peculiarities of the, you know, the, the, the UAE art scene and, and, and how it works, do you, would you, is there, you know, maybe one or two pieces of advice that you might offer to, to younger artists that are just starting out that want to establish you know, some kind of career as an as an artist here, what would be your kind of number one and two things that you would say to them? Um, one thing I would say is that you don't have to be an artist. Um, if you go into an arts educational program or, 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 or route, um, I think going into an arts program can open up so many possibilities, whether in music and fashion and and philosophy and just ways of thinking and seeing and being um, so it's not restricted to kind of like a you know um, you know just like this bubble of a studio practice that that has come to be known um, as the norm um, and so I think yeah I, I think it's um, it's a really wonderful way to just really be opened up to the world is to go through these uh, programs. However, I do want to say that there have been two significant times in my life that I wanted to quit this whole thing. Uh, One was right after, (laughs) one was right after um, 
undergrad and the other was right after grad school. So I think I do get this burnout from going through these programs. And I do go through this process, this lengthy process of re-identifying why I make the kind of work that I am and why I engage with the world in the way that I do um, and end up finding myself uh, back at the same place, um, which I, I'm really pleased that I do. I'm, I'm really grateful that I do. Um, so so it's, not, it's not this really glossy, glamorous, you know, profession at all. Um, but I do enjoy um, meeting my humanness more so than ever if I've been doing anything else. Completely sure. antithetical to you, Moza, as usual, in my response. Don't get to counteract this, hush, right? <laughs> my advice to any upcoming artists is to pick up two skills and no matter what they are, pick up two skills and take them to a very, very proficient level. Whatever it is, just take it to a very, very, very proficient level. And that's the, if, I mean, if not, I would also say just storytelling. Like if you're an extremely well-versed storyteller, no matter what, it will serve you well. I mean, I would love to say drawing, but like some people just don't like to draw. However, if they have a certain skill and they're excellent storytellers, then they'll go very far. Like I see those as very, very valuable skills to have. One is to cultivate something that only you can do to a very proficient level. And the other is to be a phenomenal storyteller. That's where it all starts, indeed. So thank you so much. We'll, we'll, we'll wrap it up there. Uh, my huge thanks to Momo and Moza for, for speaking to us tonight. And thank you to all of you. Uh, for coming along to to join us. Um, for more information about uh, other talks, uh, events, workshops that Tashkil is organizing, uh, please check out our website www.tashkil.org and follow us on Instagram at Tashkil Studio to stay up to date. Um, you can find out more about Moza's work on her website uh, and uh, Momo, I believe the best place to reach you is your Instagram account at Momo Archive. Yep. Cool. So yeah, definitely check out check out their work. Um, yeah, thank you to you both. Thank you all for coming, and we'll see you at the next talk. Good night, everyone. Bye, guys. <laughs>